My name is Steve Snyder Hill, and I'm in the U.S. Army, and I've been in since 1988. I joined the Army when I was uh, 18 years old, right out of high school, and um, basically went to Germany and lived in Germany and went to Desert Storm. Um, and I always say that, that when I was young, I always felt like that there was a darkness inside of me growing up, and I never knew what that darkness was. But it was something that I just didn't understand about myself. We went to Dachau, which is a German prison camp, and it was just such a, a profound experience to actually see where people had lost their lives for who they were. And one of the pictures that I took um, was a uniform. That uniform meant a lot to me because it was something that somebody wore that had died, and that meant a lot to me. And so I took that thing and I stuck it in a shoebox and forgot about it for years. Desert Storm was pretty difficult because it was my first war. I've been in two wars now. Um, there was a time in Desert Storm when we were in an artillery fight and um, shells were hitting on the left and the right of me. And I just closed my eyes and I thought, this is it. You know, I'm 19 years old. And I'm going to die. But I opened up my eyes and I looked and um, I saw a picture of my brother and his girlfriend. And I remember I instantly started crying because I knew then what that darkness was. It was that I was gay. And I remember crying because I thought that I would die that day and never love somebody. When I came back, I went to college, and that was when I, my coming out period and kind of finding myself. And I remember I was like every other kid. And, you know, I stuck stickers on everything, pink triangles, and I thought it was cool because I was making a statement. And silence equals death. I didn't know what it meant. I just really thought it was, you know, the it was a statement. I was standing up for myself. I was a radical college student. And I was going through those pictures, and I remember pulling that picture out of that uniform. And that's when my first, you know, roots of activism started, because that uniform had a pink triangle on it. And that's when it really hit me that that, that person could have been me. And that's, that was really profound for me. Pink triangle was, was designated for homosexuals at the time. But it was just powerful because, you know, that person died just for who he was. There was a kid at, at OSU that made fun of gay people, put in the lantern in 1995, I think it was, that his quote was, I'm glad all the fags are gone because for the first time I don't have to worry about getting AIDS. And I remember being so mad about that. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't an activist back then, but I did write a letter back to the lantern. I just want you to know that I did not go to Washington and I am gay and that I'm just like you, except there's one difference. I did go and serve my country so that that way you would have the right and the freedom to say what you said. I wanted to go back in to the service because I got out to go to college and went back in and um, I knew it was going to be hard because I was going to have to go back into the closet and that was incredibly difficult. I just had this epiphany one time I went to Red, White and Boom and we were going down there with uh, friends and family and some people from my unit asked if I was going to go down and I was like, nah, I just, you know, it's a normal thing that you just lie and oh, I'm not going to go there or whatever because I, I won't see them. But um, we went down, and I was with my friend Jenny and some, some different people. And I remember sitting there watching the fireworks, just thinking how amazing it was. And there's a part of you that always feels proud to be a soldier and, and you know, to have them honor you. It just feels so cool and, and wonderful. But I just had this rotten feeling in my gut that I had to lie about who I was to be able to be serve. When I got deployed to Iraq in 2010, we had to hide under an escalator, you know, and basically say our goodbyes and everybody else was out there, you know, hugging and, and kissing and I got on the plane. One of the first things that happened on the plane was that somebody got on the microphone and said tonight's in-flight movie is going to be Brokeback Mountain and everybody just busted out in laughter. And I remember thinking, you know, these people are my family. They're the people that are supposed to protect me if something happens in war. They're my brothers and sisters. They're my family for a year. And they're mocking me. We had an opportunity when the GOP debate came on in 2011, and they asked for questions. And so I was in Iraq serving in the middle of a war. And so we wanted to ask a question saying, after the repeal, you know, what are you going to do as a president if you become a president? Because that was a concerning question because people were going to come out and they would be vulnerable once they came out. Josh, he, like, you know, instantly was like, we have to do this. We have to ask that question. We have to know what they're going to do. People can say what you did is courageous, but courageous doesn't always have to be that you're not terrified when you do it. But it is what you do that matters. It's the act. And so we decided to do it. And Nobody knew that I was gay, but that aired on TV at 5 a.m. in the morning at my time and at 9 o'clock in the evening, Josh's time. 
And um, the crowd booed me. And that was a really, I, you know, in today's world, I guess that we're in a different kind of civility where the expectation is probably that's the norm, which is really absolutely gut-wrenching, sad. But um, back then, it really was not an expectation. And people, the American people were really outraged. You know, President Obama talked about it. And it became a lot of the, the mainstream media's focus. I was asking a question, are you not going to allow me to serve my country ju just on the basis of who I am? I'm not asking for any different behavior modification. I'm not asking for any special privilege. You know, I've never gotten in trouble. I've been decorated. I've get, gotten medals. I've, I always do what I'm supposed to do. And all I wanted to do was not have to lie about who I was. That's it. That's all I wanted. Basically, that launched uh, the ability for Josh and I to have a voice. And I mean, we wrote a book. One of the big things that I said in it was, you always have to trust the power of your voice. And I got to go talk to veterans in Chicago. And it was really cool because it was one of the first groups that I've ever talked to that it wasn't about us, it was about them. And, and I, I told this story and I said, you know, I feel, I feel like I'm sitting here telling you your own story. I mean, this is our story. That's what it's about is to be a voice for everybody else. And I think that, and veterans in general, I think that we probably all um, feel a little bit like that because we are trying to fight for people's freedom and protection. And I think that we all have a calling to do that. And I think for LGBT veterans, it's even more profound because you know, for so long we've had to fight for rights we never even had. They were going to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, so I was going to be able to serve my country for the first time openly. We were kind of a rebel to decide to get married prior to them, you know, officially accepting it, because if one of those candidates had come in and done something different, it would have been legal record, and, you know, I could have gotten kicked out for that. We're driving to D.C., my mom's Googling, we're trying to figure out, you know, where we could do this that would be meaningful for us. And we stumbled across Leonard Matlovich, who is a tech sergeant in the Air Force, who died. Um, and on his gravestone, it says, when I was in the military, they gave me a medal for um, killing two men and a discharge for loving one. And that just instantly sealed the deal for us. So that's what we did. We got married there. We had an opportunity to join a lawsuit to try to advocate for marriage equality and sue the Department of Defense while I was in a war. Uh, we joined eight couples, and Josh did a lot of the work back home while I was over there serving. But he met one of the couples, and he kept telling me about her, um, and her name was Charlie Morgan. And she, you know, he's like, she's so wonderful. This woman is so great, and I just love her to death. And, you know, she has a wife, Karen, and a daughter, Casey, and they're just so great. And I just, she makes me so happy. And so we found out that, that Charlie had cancer, and um, Charlie basically spent the last days of her life advocating for marriage equality. I mean, she had a daughter and a, and a wife, and she could have spent time with them back home, you know, in her last days, but she didn't. She advocated. And Charlie ended up passing prior to, to what happened with Windsor. Um, so she never got to see it. You know, she never got to see the freedom that, that she spent her last breathing days fighting for. There are thousands of people out there like Charlie that have never been able to, to see that freedom, that have fought so hard for it. Nobody ever understands the power that we all have, that, that you have to trust the power of your voice. You can absolutely go out and in one day you can change the world 